Hello, this is Kiros Prohane again, uh, Professor and Director of Graduate Programs in Biostatistics and Epidemiology at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, California, United States of America. Uh, this is part two of a series of lectures um, that was a result of um, a workshop, a short course that was conducted at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. Uh, this was organized by the Africa chapter of the International Society of Environmental Epidemiology. Uh, this uh, part uh, of the lecture series was focusing on data management and data analysis. Uh, it follows uh, another part one lecture that you might have attended to already on basics on conducting research. So uh, we'll continue from where we stopped uh, last time. So the broad outline of the topics covered will be on data collection and management very briefly. And then we'll uh, talk about basic concepts in biostatistics, focusing on linear models. And uh, then we'll end up with analysis of correlated data and multi-level models. And again, a very brief overview or introduction. As in the first part, uh, a lot of the slides were adapted from many other workshops that were conducted as part of the uh, Eastern Africa GeoHealth Hub, Global Environmental and Occupational Health Hub for Eastern Africa which is funded by the Fogarty International at NIH and also the uh, IDRC from Canada. Uh, a lot of, lots of materials also come from the Southern California CTSI, which is funded by NIH, and many other uh, training uh, workshops, including the one on household air pollution that was conducted in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, about four or five years ago in collaboration with the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and also, uh, a lot of the materials also come from a summer program that we have here at USC, uh, funded by NHLBI, uh, NIH, um, on uh, trying to train the next generation of biostatisticians uh, from undergraduate programs, which is called LSBest at USC. Lots of materials and slides were also obtained, uh, courtesy of uh, a colleague and a friend, John Summit, who is a DNM professor at the uh, University of Colorado. I'd also like to acknowledge the um, support of the uh, Southern California CTSI uh, in making this uh, study available and the recordings available for uh, people to watch this uh, lecture series uh, from the comfort of their home. So the first part is going to uh, focus on data management. Again, we are going to deal with very, very basic details with a lot of detail. Um, I'm obviously, I think a lot of you have uh, collected data and uh, some of the data collection methods are to uh, d collect information using questionnaires, you know, conducting interviews or abstracting data from charts in clinical settings, uh, from existing databases that are increasingly becoming available and uh, quite extensive, uh, from laboratory assays or physical exams or physical monitoring uh, uh, of, uh, let's say, pollution levels or physical activity which um, is growing in both dimension and uh, depths, especially with wearable devices and uh, many other um, devices or uh, technology, new technologies that allows uh, you know, collection of data at very unprecedented and huge and uh, multidimensional scale. So briefly, as an example, I'll talk a little bit about questionnaires. Questionnaires could be open-ended or closed-ended. Uh, Open-ended questionnaires allow participants to report in their own words. They are most of the time qualitative. Uh, they are often used in exploratory phase of uh, kind of question uh, design or uh, generation of, uh, you know, kind of in preparation for a bigger, well-conducted and systematic study. Closed-ended, you basically have limited choice of answers. Uh, it leads to quantitative data. It's easier to analyze because there is consistency and comparability in uh, responses from participants. Uh, but the downside of this is, of course, the list of answers may not be exhaustive, and therefore you might miss some possibilities. But if it's a well-designed questionnaire, then uh, that issue is minimized. I'm co focusing on questionnaires because, especially in the African context, this might be still the mode uh, of collecting information from study participants. So the design of a questionnaire is very important, uh, and most of the time it's not trivial, uh, but uh, some concepts that uh, people need to be uh, paying attention to is that there should be clarity, simplicity, and neutrality. 
So in other words, you shouldn't uh, infuse stereotypes into the questionnaire. You should use as simple as possible words and grammar and uh, should be clarity and specificity in the question so that there is no confusion and uh, different intentions in terms of understanding the questions. You most of the time use, uh, should use validated questionnaire or you have to conduct a validation study at the beginning of the study period if it's a new questionnaire. And especially in the African context and uh, developing countries context, uh, it's very, very important when you're tra translating questionnaires from other languages that you actually do the translation very carefully, but at the same time, you also need to conduct a back translation so that you know, there is uh, no uh, kind of uh, lost in translation type uh, situation, which is very, very important, as uh, we have recently discovered in our own studies in the GeoHealth Hub for Eastern Africa. Data management is equally important, uh, whether you're dealing with administrative data or study data or, uh, you know, in either case, you have to actually have a very systematic database management program, uh, especially in combining source of data for the study and making them available and uh, ready for um, follow-up analysis. So the data tables have to be very clearly, um, you know, laid out. Um, you know, for instance, in this case, rows could correspond to individuals and columns could correspond to variables. Uh, and there should be, you know, easy linkage by unique identifier for any subject or participant uh, through an ID. Uh, and there has to be a very systematic and well laid out multi-table relational database um, structured as part of the study period. These uh, few slides basically give some examples. I'm not going to go through a lot of details of this. Uh, you need to have a data dictionary in order to define exactly which variable means what and how it's studied, what kind of data it is, uh, and probably, you know, kind of, you know, whether the length of the string, many elements that actually need uh, to be paid attention to so that when as some other person comes and tries to use the data, there is no ambiguity in terms of what was the intention in collecting the data and putting the database together. Uh, data entry should be very carefully done and there should be um, systems in place to basically make sure that uh, information is correctly entered and correctly maintained and correctly catalogued and also uh, the data quality issue needs to be paid attention to. Um, again, in extracting data, there has to be a systematic um, you know, process in terms of how to go about it. Uh, there should be a very clearly laid out standard uh, uh, operational procedures or SOP in terms of exactly how to do uh, this kind of uh, you know uh, activities. Um, there has to be well laid out plan for queries, and finally, there should be due attention. This is very important. I cannot emphasize it enough uh, in terms of maintaining confidentiality of the participants and also security of the data. And these are mandated uh, under several laws and regulations by many countries, but uh, just in case of integrity, in terms of integrity, people also need to pay attention to this uh, issue of confidentiality and take it very seriously. And for security, again, you have to maintain the security of the data, but at the same time, you should also guard against loss of data by having a very systematic uh, backing up system and uh, including off-site locations in case uh, things happen that could actually undermine and destroy data that comes from this valuable, expensive and time-consuming studies. So that's all I want to say about data management. It's not enough, but at least it will give you some fundamental concepts. Uh, the second part of this uh, lecture is to really go through some really basic concepts in biostatistics. Uh, we are trying to uh, basically use the simplest possible concepts or topic and try to really convey uh, what the fundamental concepts mean when people move to more complicated uh, situations. The concepts remain the same. So we're going to go with just a simple linear regression to begin with and try to lay out what the issues are. So in this case, it's a very simple model. You have an outcome Y, you have a v predictor X, uh, and then you have a very simple linear regression where a single predictor is trying to predict uh, the outcome Y, and the model itself has an intercept, which is beta naught, uh, a slope, a linear slope in this case, which is beta one, which basically gives you the change in the outcome per one unit change in X. And then finally, 
uh, because this is not a deterministic equation, you have an error. Uh, anything that's not explained by x is going to be basically um, held in as part of E, so it's really a stochastic model. So in this case, both y and x are random variables. And the fundamental equation of a simple linear regression is essentially that the expected value of the outcome given the predictor is simply equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x, an intercept and a slope times x. And of course, the expectation of the errors is zero because you, you don't, on average, the errors we assume or we expect to be zero. So you're really talking about the conditional expectation of y of the outcome given the value of x. So in other words, you're asking the question, what's the average value of the outcome for any given value of x? Okay. So let's say um, we're trying to understand whether cholesterol depends on age. So y in this case is cholesterol level, and then x is the age of the participants. And you're really trying to find the slope and the intercept under this linear relationship. And there are several assumptions that we need to make. Okay, and the assumptions are as follows. So first of all, you need to have the existence of the relationship. And then we have what we call, for simplicity of um, remembering, what we call the line assumptions. You're assuming linearity of the relationship between the two, which may or may not be true. You're assuming independence of the data. In other words, each participant is different from the other, completely independent from each other. And then you're also assuming normality of the distribution of the outcome and the error. And uh, finally, you're assuming that there is equal variability, equal variance. And I'll come back to this a little bit more complicated uh, concept later on. So when we say existence, basically what we are trying to say is that before we try to use a line to describe the relationship or the um, you know, interdependence between the random variables x and y, then we have to make the following assumptions, uh, where for any fixed value of x, y is a random variable with population mean mu and population variance sigma square. And for any fixed value of x, y is a random variable with finite mean and finite variance. So there is something that you can actually measure. It's not going to extremes. The notation y given x indicates that the mean mu and the variance sigma square of y depends on the value of x. So these are kind of the existent type assumption. We're also uh, assuming that each curve is a distribution of y for a given x. And uh, the mean of the distribution of y is mu of y given x or conditional on x. So connecting the dots that represent these means will form a regression line. Uh, in this case, you know, where we are actually coming to linearity. Uh, and the regression line is linear. Okay? So this, are again, may or may not be true, but we are assuming that the relationship is linear, linearity or linear. Yeah, in this case, actually, this is something that we can easily um, relax and try to um, include other nonlinear terms in the model. But we're keeping it simple for this case. So essentially, what I have said in words is what we have here. Uh, we have a linear relationship between x and y. Uh, so you have an observed uh, y, which is basically you know, what you have here. Okay? And you have the value that's falling on the line, which is basically this dot. And the gap between the observed and the expected essentially is what you have the error. So the idea is to try to minimize the sum of squares of this error so that the line passes as close as possible to every point uh, in, uh, in the data scatter plot. The other assumption is independence. Conditional on the x, the y values are statistically independent of one another. So in other words, you're saying the errors are independent of one another. And this is typically satisfied when there is one measurement per person. Yes and no, because some people could actually be aggregated in families or some genetic makeup or some other characteristic that makes them similar. And of course, this assumption is violated in many situations. Uh, if you take, let's say, measurements of height on each subject over time, this gives you to temporal dependence. Or if you c measure cholesterol in family members of the same family, of course, you'll have familiar clustering. This could be a lifestyle issue or genetic issue and so on and so forth. Therefore, when violated, a different regression approach is needed. And this is actually something that we are going to end up with this lecture at the end, uh, you know, at least briefly. The other assumption is normality. For any fixed um, you know, uh, value of x or the predictor, y has a normal distribution. 
So in other words, we are actually saying the errors or residuals are normally distributed. As in any other situations, normality is required for the validity in hypothesis testing in confidence intervals. Actually, most of the time, it's not required for the estimation of the parameters themselves. But when you try to make uh, inference or try to reach conclusions, then you probably need uh, that kind of um, you know, uh, assumption of normality. Of course, with large sample size, the, you know, what we call the central limit theorem makes inferences robust to any deviations from this assumption. So given uh, adequate sample size, this may not be a big issue. <coughs> this uh, figure essentially uh, kind of uh, epitomizes what I have said now in terms of what exactly we mean by normality assumption. Uh, uh, and then I think you can actually go through that uh, in, your, in your own time. Uh, the other issue, which is a little bit more complicated, is the issue of equal variance. And sometimes this has a very fancy sounding name, what we call homoscedasticity. So in other words, what we're saying is for any fixed value of x, the variance of the outcome is a constant. So it doesn't vary. And uh, we'll actually, if you come to uh, non-continuous, non-normally distributed data, we can easily see that this is not the case, and therefore it could be violated in many situations. So assumptions of normality and equal variance are, uh, actually they state that the residuals E or error are normally distributed with mean zero and common variance sigma square. So that common variance comes from this equal variance assumption. So in summary, the line assumptions are you know, linearity, independence, normality, and equal variance. And of course, we can look at the regression residuals, or basically, once you feed the model, what remains as the residuals in order to see whether these fundamental and important assumptions are actually satisfied in our regression model. So remember, we're actually going after the slope of a line, okay? And we're also trying to use what we call least squares approach in order to minimize the sum of squares of these deviations of the observed values from what's actually falling on the line, okay? Uh, again, I'm not going to go through a lot of details about this. Most of you, I'm sure, have taken uh, the very basic statistics course. Uh, and the least squares approach is essentially trying to um, really minimize the gap between what is observed, which is y sub i, uh, and what's um, you know, uh, predicted, which is y hat sub i. And this difference squared, and when you sum it, it, you know, the least squares approach essentially tries to find the equations for the intercept and the slope that actually gives you the smallest possible what you call sum square of error. That's basically the uh, least squares approach that uh, everyone uses, and uh, uh, whether you know it or not, whenever you click uh, fitter regression line for me, the underlying concept is basically that this quantity is being minimized. Again, I'm not going to belabor the formula on this slide, but essentially the result is basically you have a uh, simple looking formula that uh, for many, many years people actually did by hand. Nowadays, you basically rely on software uh, programs that will do it for you. But it's very important that you understand the underlying concepts, uh, which is the purpose of this lecture. So. Again, we talked briefly about the R software in the first part of this lecture series. Uh, we haven't gone through R uh, carefully, therefore, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But you know, there are well-built-in functions, like in this case, LM, uh, that actually will basically, once you give it the outcome and you give it the predictor, and you give it a data set that has Y and X, then essentially it will do everything for you that we have talked about. And there are certain you know, elements of the program that will give you summary statistics. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide simply because we haven't gone through the R uh, you know, uh, procedure. But uh, if you go to the R software, those of you who are familiar, and those of you who are not, if you actually attend the uh, basics on R lecture, which hopefully we'll have uh, put together uh, for you, then you'll be able to actually conduct this, your own analysis and try to interpret. So once you have done this, either you use R software or your own hands or any other uh, uh, popular package that you're, uh, you know, your favorite, then the bigger uh, you know, issue is actually once you have the numbers, what to make of them? How do you interpret these parameter estimates? So the slope estimate essentially gives you the estimated change in the mean outcome per increase of one unit in the predictor. So in other words, in our example, what is the estimated mean cholesterol increase um, 
uh, as you increase uh, <coughs> you know age by one year and if you go back to the outcomes basically what you have here is you know the slope is estimated at 0.91 and the intercept is estimated as 177.9 therefore if you go to the next slide essentially you're saying that there is a 0.91 increase in milligram per deciliter in cholesterol level per one year, one year increase in age in the participants. And when the, um, you know, the uh, uh, predictor or age is zero at, uh, you know, at the beginning, then the milk cholesterol level is 176.9 milligram per deciliter. So the next question is, of course, to make a test. You know, the question is, is 0.91 really different from zero. In other words, is there a significant relationship between uh, age and cholesterol? And uh, the program actually allows you to make a test. And in this case, if you go back to the output I showed you, uh, the T value or the test statistic value is 2.9. And this leads to what we call the P value of point, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, the P value of 0 0.004. If you go back to the, um, you know, part one of the lecture, we actually talked about the concept of P value. Essentially, since we are assuming that uh, we are uh, tolerating a 5% probability of rejecting the null hypothesis of no um, you know, effect when it's true, uh, then this p-value is 0 0.004. Therefore, there is much smaller probability of uh, actually committing that error. And therefore, there is a significant relationship between age and cholesterol level. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis, then the implication is that of all the lines we could consider, a flat line is actually as good as any. In other words, there is, you're basically saying that there is no relationship. That slope of 0.91 is not significantly different from a flat line or a zero, right? Of course, there could be a nonlinear relationship. And in this case, because you're assuming a linear relationship, then you can completely miss that nonlinear relationship as well. So it's actually very important that you do a thorough model building to see whether the relationship is indeed linear. And uh, the f next few slides actually go through some concepts about what exactly you mean by intercept, how you calculate it, and uh, what the components of these calculations are, uh, which I'll again make the slide available, but not go through the equations uh, in, in, in great detail in the interest of time. The other concept is, of course, as you might have uh, know, known already, the concept of confidence intervals. Uh, you can either try to calculate what we call the test statistic to see whether there is the value that you calculate is you know, bigger than any uh, fundamental cutoff value based on the level of significance or the error of uh, rejecting H0 when it's true that you're uh, willing to tolerate. The other flip side of it is actually to try to calculate what we call a confidence interval. So in other words, you know, what is the 95% confidence that the estimate that he got uh, or the true estimate is contained with an um, you know, uh, a value, uh, in two values, what we call the lower limit and the upper limit. And if, let's say, your hypothesized value is zero, in other words, the slope is actually zero, there is no relationship between age and cholesterol, then if your confidence interval does not contain zero, that means you actually have rejected the null hypothesis, and there is indeed a relationship between uh, age and cholesterol in this linear model setting. So, uh, this formula, this slide actually give you uh, the way to calculate the confidence intervals. And of course, your popular software will also give you these numbers, both the lower limit and the upper limit. But you know, whatever conclusion you reach from testing a hypothesis is going to be exactly the same depending on the procedure you're using uh, that you reach uh, based on the confidence intervals as well. So the confidence interval for the regression line, uh, then essentially, um, uh, you know, starts from parameter of interest, then the predicted value, uh, then you compute the confidence interval for each estimate of the mean value of y for a given value of x, and then this will give you a 1 minus alpha, where alpha is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's true, uh, and it gives you a confidence interval around the line. And uh, remember, the line connects all of this mu of uh, the outcome or the mean of the outcome given x, basically, is uh, what you're ending up with by using the let squares approach that we have already talked about. So essentially, what I have said is uh, on, this, um, on this slide, you, know, you basically have the line that's estimated, uh, 
and there is a confidence band around it uh, that's actually kind of the light green you know band and then of course the dark blue dots or circles are the actual data that was collected as part of the study okay so once you have reached to this level you have actually already conducted all the uh, you know um, analysis you have uh, you know done you know the calculations of the estimates of the parameters and uh, you know have also conducted the calculation of the confidence interval around the regression line now there is a confidence interval around the slope and around the intercept which we have already talked about but what we have here was basically the confidence band around the regression line which are related concepts you can also talk about confidence intervals for the prediction, uh, which has slightly different uh, formula. Uh, again, in the interest of time, uh, the slides are available, and I'm going to slow down a little bit so that you actually can capture the details. But um, uh, again, it's something that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. But if the purpose is prediction, then the prediction interval is actually slightly different for valid reasons uh, compared to the confidence interval of the regression line itself. Okay, and again, um, you can, um, you know, uh, do this using um, uh, built-in uh, functions in R, which again, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail on here, but uh, once you familiarize yourself with R, then probably something that you would like to come back to and try to uh, do some practice um, in, in, the, in terms of uh, uh, doing this kind of calculations and plotting so that you can visualize your findings. Okay, again, this slide basically gives you a recap of you know uh, regression confidence intervals and what the formulas associated are, and whether you're talking about you know parameter estimates, which is the first bullet, uh, or um, you have uh, you know um, confidence interval for the regression line or confidence intervals for the predictions. All right, so. Checking line model assumptions, how do you check the residuals? This is actually a very important exercise uh, and it actually could make or break your analysis uh, because if your assumptions are not satisfied, then clearly I think uh, you're not going to uh, find, uh, you know, uh, reach valid conclusions because uh, you're really working under a false uh, premise. Uh, the issue of homoscedasticity or equal variances uh, essentially is when residuals have equal variance, then what you want to see is an even scatter around the zero line, right? So basically, uh, uh, you know, if you do the plots of the residuals and you see something like this, then that would be reassuring. Um, if you have, you know, this kind of plot, for instance, in the first one, uh, you have something that's actually funneling out. So you have a kind of tight, you know, uh, values around the uh, horizontal line here, but you know, you know, this um, tightness is kind of relaxed as you move forward, uh, as opposed to something that's actually not really uh, falling, you know, above and below this horizontal line of zero for errors, but, you know, there is also more or less constant, you know, spread, you know, as you move forward. So, you know, in this case, then, in which case uh, is actually, um, you know, the homoscedasticity or equal variance assumption met? And uh, if you really think about it carefully in the first one, even though everything is around the zero line, uh, it's actually funneling out. So the equality of variance is not satisfied as opposed to the lower one where you actually have homoscedasticity assumption met, even though you have this weird looking parabolic relationship uh, between um, the zero line and uh, you know, the residuals uh, from the model. We'll come back to this later. When res residuals have, um, you know, when they show uh, a linearity, we also want to see an even scatter around the zero line, right? So in this case, then uh, you would like to have equal, you know, spread above and below. So the red and the blue actually more or less uh, should cancel out, right? So you have it here. But in this case, obviously, in the first one, uh, you have no homoscedasticity. You don't have equality of variance because of the funneling out. Uh, however, you know, the reds and the blues are actually kind of evening out as opposed to here where you have the same height, you know, uh, whenever you are on the plot, but if you look at what's above and below the, red, the horizontal line, the zero line, then you actually have more on the red some places and more on the green on the other, on uh, indigo on the other places. So the linearity um, assumption actually in this case is not satisfied. So these are things that you need to pay attention to in order to uh, basically um, you know, come up, um, you know, with um, whether we have uh, satisfied the assumptions or not. Uh, 
Uh, other, you know, issues to pay attention to, you know, what to do when you're dealing with categorical X variables or predictors, uh, or, uh, you know, for instance, if you're dealing with two-level or binary X variables and uh, what the nuances are, again, something that probably we shouldn't spend too much time on today, but it's something that you can actually read the slides here and uh, the pull-ups here and then familiarize yourself with, um, you know, with issues that are, that are of interest and of uh, fundamental importance when you do modeling. Uh, I'm not going to go to a lot of detail about, you know, uh, you know uh, issues uh, with uh, model implementation using the R software because we haven't taken the time again, but uh, this is something for you to uh, play with um, if and when you have the time and the interest. Um, again, this is a follow-up from uh, uh, what I, I just have um, talked about in, in words, but here the implementation uh, using R basically in conducting two sample theses and how it relates to when the predictor is binary. Uh, the other issue is, of course, you know, uh, outcomes are not always continuous. So in this case, uh, we're taking the example of binary outcome. In other words, instead of uh, the outcome being any value on the continuous scale, uh, positive or from negative infinity to positive infinity, uh, here actually the outcome is taking one of two values, either one if an event occurs or zero if it does not occur. This is what we call binomial distribution, um, you know, uh, following a outcome or a binary outcome. Um, and the purpose of the regression or model is essentially the same whether you're dealing with uh, continuous or binary, but um, the way you go about it actually is very different because the basic assumptions that have the chance of being satisfied when you're dealing with a uh, continuous outcome may not be you know, even possible at the outset unless you do something about the modeling process when you're dealing with binary outcomes. So we actually go to something called logistic regression when we try to deal with this. Again, this is something that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on today, but I just want to, to point out um, that you know, there are ways actually of uh, fitting a different type of regression in order to deal with this uh, categorical or binary outcomes where the outcome takes only values one, one way or the other, not on the continuous scale. So, what do we use in this case? Well, um, uh, we use what we call a logistic regression uh, with some transformation of the outcome itself to make sure that you actually have this transformation from the zero one scale, you know, going basically to minus infinity to infinity on a carefully selected, uh, you know, uh, function. Uh, of course, I'm hiding a lot of concepts and thinking and uh, theory uh, behind this in terms of how we go about it and how we try to deal with the modeling process uh, in the interest of time because it's beyond the scope of this lecture, but probably something that we can come back to in much more detail later on in other parts um, of this lecture series. So briefly, in logistic regression, you're really interested in probability of y, whether y takes the value one or not. You have a minimum of value of zero or one because this is a probability. We have the concept of odd, basically, what's the probability of y is equal to one over minus the probability of y is equal to one. So basically, the chance of taking the value one over the chance of taking the value zero. Uh, so what are the odds of you know being a case or having the value one? Uh, or we have what we call what log odds, basically taking the log transformation of this quantity, uh, which essentially will take the range of values from zero to infinity to actually go all the way from minus infinity to infinity. So essentially, you're transforming the outcome or the expected value uh, to take you know, a full range from minus infinity to infinity. And the plots in the bottom uh, basically try to uh, you know, familiarize yourself pictorially, uh, graphically, in terms of uh, some of the concepts we are talking about here. Okay, so when we're fitting logistic regression, basically have this S-shaped, uh, you know, uh, function that will uh, come as a result. Uh, again, I'm glossing over a lot of technical details here, but uh, uh, I think, you know, suffice to say basically is that when you're dealing with a binary outcome, then the logistic regression is actually the way to go about modeling, you cannot just fit a simple linear regression or a multiple linear regression to an outcome that's not continuous, but there are ways of actually dealing with the modeling process. And one way of dealing with it uh, when dealing with binary outcome is the so-called logistic regression. Again, something that we can come back to at some other point 
uh, in a different uh, part of this lecture series. Okay, I'm going uh, slow to gloss over a lot of these details again in the interest of time. Uh, essentially, you have the same concepts, you know, you have, um, you know, a slope uh, that's going to be of interest and uh, you still test whether the beta 1 uh, slope is essentially whether it's taking value 0 or not, which, you know, as we have said in previously, it translates to, you know, the odds ratio being equal to 1 or different from 1, where greater than 1 is more risk uh, for the outcome and less than 1 is protective against the outcome. Again, there are ways of actually fitting uh, logistic regression in the R software or any of your popular softwares like SAS, SPSS, Tara, or even writing your own function, uh, if you feel like it, uh, you know, should be not uh, outside of the realm of possibility if you have the motivation and the interest. So you essentially end up with, you know, fitting the model, uh, you estimate the parameters, and you try to see whether the, you know, uh, test statistic really rejects uh, whether there is a significant relationship between the predictor and the outcome, in this case a binary outcome. Okay, so in terms of interpretation, uh, essentially, if you fit a model, let's say you end up with an odds ratio of, well, let's say, 1.09 or 1.09 in this case, uh, then uh, in this case you're basically trying to uh, uh, look at the relationship between age and being overweight. Uh, what you're saying here, if you end up with an estimate of 1.09, what you're saying here is basically that the odds of being overweight are 1.09 times higher than the odds uh, of not being overweight for each one year increase in age. So the question is whether this is significant enough to make a difference to lead to obesity or other related health uh, uh, problems that are associated with obesity and o being overweight. So uh, in this case also, it's a good idea to report confidence intervals on your estimated parameters rather than just p-values because it gives you in terms of how far you are from the age of b being significant or not. Even though depending on the value of the p, uh, on the actual value of the p-value, uh, you can guess in terms of whether you're too far away from the hypothesized value or you're right in the middle of it depending on whether the p-value is very small compared to the 0.05 cutoff or much higher than that. Uh, as uh, I'm sure you have seen in, uh, in practice. You can also extend both the simple linear regression and logistic regression to uh, include multiple predictors. Uh, we also talked about, you know, confounding effect modification in the first part of this lecture series and all this come into play. Even though your interest is on a spe specific risk factor, you can actually look at whether adjustment for other factors or uh, interacting with other factors could actually make a difference in the relationship. So now we are coming to the last part of this, um, you know, fundamentals of uh, biostatistics uh, part of the lecture series. Uh, and we're going to consider uh, um, the concept of, you know, when data are not independent from each other. One of the fundamental assumptions in linear models, as you have seen in uh, the part that we have just covered, was that we assume independence between the observations from the individual data points. But if we have multiple measurements per subject or you have some aggregation by familial or genetic factors uh, or some, you know, lifestyle characteristics, of course, this, uh, violation, this vi you know, assumption is violated. So the question is what to do when data are not independent. This is a very, very important concept when you talk about uh, uh, environmental data, for instance, as uh, I'm sure you have uh, incorporated. So very briefly, the objectives are, you know, to define what we mean by correlated data to really understand what are the issues that actually make us worry when you're dealing with correlated data, what happens when you uh, ignore correlation in the data. Um, and we briefly introduce methods for analyzing uh, what we call correlated or independent data. Uh, understanding the general setup, or framework of methods, um, and then introduction to multi-level models, which is a, vari a variant of uh, the overall um, area of uh, uh, correlated data. So what are the features of longitudinal data? So th there could be repeated observations on individuals or participants, allowing the direct study of change. Uh, what we call longitudinal data, which is really, uh, you know, repeated measures data, uh, require sophisticated statistical techniques because the repeated observations are usually, and most of the time, positively correlated or dependent on each other. So we really have to pay attention to that. 
the sequential nature of measures implies that certain types of correlation structures are actually likely to arise. So I think you know we can exploit that kind of uh, special structures in dealing with uh, you know correlated data in a very systematic fashion. And of course, correlation itself must or dependence itself must be accounted for in order to obtain valid inferences, which is actually one good reason why we care about it. So. Let's go back to some fundamental, uh, you know, issues in terms of, you know, what we call longitudinal versus cross-sectional studies, where you have only one measurement per, uh, you know, per subject or per participants. Uh, again, this is something that we have already uh, covered, but maybe I'll concentrate on the last bullet, where in dealing with longitudinal data analysis, which I'll refer to LDA sometimes afterwards, we can investigate actually two different relationships. We can study change over time within individuals which usually we call aging effect, or we can focus on differences between people in their baseline levels, which we call cohort effects. And of course, longitudinal data analysis requires special methods because the set of observations on one subject tend to be intercorrelated or interrelated with each other. So I'm going to use actually a, a cartoon uh, picture that was uh, first introduced by Deagle, Hegarty, Liang, and Ziegler in their famous book, uh, analysis of longitudinal data, uh, second edition is 2002. Uh, it starts basically with a, a simple set of uh, points on a plot where people are studying reading ability and age. And here you only have uh, the scatter plot. And essentially, uh, if, you know, if you have a trained eye or even non-trained eye, you can say that reading ability appears to be poorer among older children. But if someone came back and told you that these points are actually interrelated, in other words, uh, each pair of points actually come from the same individual, then the picture is very different. Uh, it actually have uh, some hidden uh, feature revealed in this case. So basically you have improvements within a child, but overall downward trend with age is what we observe. But then again, if someone else came back and said to you, this is actually the true picture, uh, what he had before was wrong, then the conclusion is completely different. But the bottom line here is, first of all, I think, you know, the interconnectivity of the points could make the difference, uh, big difference in the interpretation of uh, what the data is trying to tell you. But also, you have the ability of distinguishing between what we call intra and inter-subject trends uh, when you deal with uh, repeated measures or longitudinal data. So why do we need special methods? Well, of course, I think, you know, the assumption of independence is violated, so you have to find out, you know, a way of how to deal with uh, this kind of complicated data structure. Um, and of course, what would be wrong with ignoring the intra-subject correlation, which is a very important question, because if there is nothing to worry about, then we can just simply go ahead and naively use standard regression methods. Of course, a lot of things will go wrong, which is why we're spending the time to talk about this. Uh, the estimates of regression coefficients may become what we call inefficient. In other words, there is lack of efficiency in the estimation process. Uh, very simplistically uh, said or stated, basically you're not using all your available information in a very efficient manner. Uh, it may also lead to incorrect inference, which is very, very worrisome, uh, probably the most serious problem. Or also, I mean, we may be fundamentally uh, interested in actually studying the dependence structure itself. So unless we have uh, the right methods, we may not be able to, to deal with this. Okay. So again, you know, the opportunity to provide, uh, to unmask important relationships, to ability to distinguish between what we call longitudinal and cross-sectional effects. Uh, and of course, you know, the many effects that could be of interest, what you know, was the baseline effect, was the temporal trend, you know, what are the factors that affect the degree of interdependence between the data points? All this could be of scientific interest on their own and therefore uh, actually lead to special methods for studying this. So very briefly, I'm going to introduce uh, a study that uh, we have been conducting for over 20 years in, the, uh, in Southern uh, California, uh, from University of Southern California. Uh, it's called the Children's Health Study. It has multiple outcomes, uh, lung function, uh, biomass index, asthma, school absenteeism, and as you can see, you know, different type of outcomes actually lead to different types of, uh, you know, uh, nature or characteristics of the data. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the design uh, because that's not the purpose of this lecture, but suffices to say that actually this uh, study collected data over time on 
each participant on almost 11 or 12,000 of them. It also have aggregation that's built in, in terms of having multiple communities and schools within communities and children within the schools and then uh, time within the child that we really have to pay attention to when we try to analyze the data. Uh, I'm going to uh, gloss over some of the slides because uh, the design uh, details themselves are not that important, but it basically goes back to the first part of the lecture series where designing the study is as important as analyzing the data uh, because once you have the wrong designs, then what you end up with is going to be simply garbage in, garbage out. So essentially, uh, there was a very careful assessment in terms of the study design and the study ended up with 12 uh, communities first and ended up with 16 communities all told. Uh, and then several outcomes were measured uh, very carefully. There was attention to the effect of air pollution, both at the regional level and at the local level. And uh, the models actually allowed the kind of ab ability to distinguish between these different types of uh, spatial aggregation or uh, uh, geographic you know, uh, aggregation types. Again, this is a very rich data set uh, from about almost 11 or 12,000 children, spanning the entire age range of, um, you know, of childhood. Uh, and this actually gives you a very simple example of uh, that sometimes linearity is not always the right way to analyze data. And we spent a lot of time uh, trying to capture the nonlinearity in the relationships. As you can see here, there is a clear nonlinearity because of growth part during the pubertal age. I'm not going to go to uh, a lot of the details uh, of uh, the physiology behind it because that's not the purpose of this lecture, but you have the slides to go after uh, and look uh, you know, and read the papers from this important study. The structure of the data itself is very important. You can lay it out so that you have the individual uh, participants on the horizontal and then each time point is following you know, as columns in the data, or you can have a different orientation uh, uh, where you basically have each subject's time points basically given the different rows. The way you deal with it uh, with different softwares could be different. Some software prefer one way or the other, so you have to really pay attention to that. And of course, again, we come back to the issue of why do we need special methods for longitudinal data analysis? Uh, essentially, it's the, you know, the you know, issues that we have already laid out in previous slides, so I'm not going to go back to that, but here it's actually going back to the actual statistical reasons in terms of what, would, what could go wrong. Remember, when we talked about the best statistics, uh, uh, you know, uh, fundamental issues when we talk about simple linear mod models, one of the bigger issues or one of the main assumptions was the fact that, you know, the observations are supposed to be independent. And it's clear when you're dealing with uh, correlated longitudinal data, this assumption is violated and therefore you have to do something about it. Okay, uh, this is going back to the CHS data, simply giving you an example, so probably again something that we shouldn't spend too much time on. Well, let's go back to the kind of things that we can do. Uh, we said that we can actually distinguish between what we call cross-sectional and longitudinal um, you know, um, relationships. So when you have a cross-sectional versus a longitudinal study, if you only have one measurement per subject or per participant, then it's really a cross-sectional design. Then you will be able only to look at that first equation here, basically how y is related to x. But if you allow for a longitudinal design, essentially what you end up with is with two different parameters, right? You have what we call the cross-sectional effect, which is really saying, you know, how is uh, you know, uh, at any point in time, how is the outcome related to the uh, predictor? But you can also easily study the change in X and how it's affecting the change in Y. So you basically have two different uh, regression parameters to go after, the cross-sectional effect and the longitudinal effect. And they do not have to be exactly the same in magnitude. They could be very different. Or you can test whether they are the same or not, in which case you can basically have a common estimate for both. But the model itself allows you uh, the design itself allows you to look at these two different aspects. Coming back to the example that we had uh, on the reading ability uh, example, uh, in this case, uh, you can actually distinguish between uh, the cross-sectional and the longitudinal effects. And uh, under B, uh, you know, we saw that you know, the cross-sectional and longitudinal estimates or parameters actually have opposite signs and under C they had the same sign. Regardless, it's also possible that the magnitude itself could be very different or very similar. 
So these are the kind of things that uh, a longitudinal model could actually allow you uh, to go after and assess properly. Um, cross-sectional versus longitudinal studies. Um, uh, in cross-sectional studies, you're really comparing individuals or participants with different values of the risk factor or what we call predictor. In longitudinal studies, um, you have the additional ability to assess uh, within subject, of, or within participant across time variation and also the between subject or between participant variation. And of course, in longitudinal data or design, each person also acts as his or her own control. Um, and you know, it's not that difficult to see that only cross-sectional uh, studies are, or, or co only cross-sectional effects are confounded by unmeasured individual characteristics, simply because of the fact that each participant is acting as his or her or con control, as we have seen uh, in our, in our, in our um, assessments. In terms of approach to longitudinal data analysis, for many years, uh, when uh, mo methods were not readily available, uh, people actually try to summarize data to come up with summary measures uh, so that essentially, basically, losing information to simplify the model. So people reduce the repeated values into one or two summary values and then try to analyze each summary variable as a function of covariates. Or some you know, more sophisticated methods try to use a two-stage analysis, but the field has come a long way in its ability to actually examine data in its proper context so that you know, all the information collected in a very expensive and time-consuming way is properly uh, exploited by using the right modeling techniques. So briefly, without going into a lot of details, there are three general, general approaches you know, to longitudinal data analysis, what we call marginal models, uh, what we call random or mixed effects models, or sometimes called conditional models, or what we call transition models. Marginal models are very, very similar to the kind of uh, models that we spent a lot of time on at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, they essentially try to deal with uh, the dependence in the data by having a separate uh, model for the correlation and try to adjust or correct for any kind of um, uh, correlation uh, in the data in order to make sure that proper inference is uh, drawn from the data. Uh, whereas in random effects models, uh, you assume independence but only conditional on certain what we call random effects or kind of you know, uh, factors that are unmeasured uh, but uh, are assumed to follow some uh, statistical distribution. However, uh, a third type of approach, which we call transition model, even use a very different philosophical uh, approach or uh, you know, attitude towards uh, longitudinal data analysis, essentially tries to attribute the dependence in the data on dependence of current outcomes on past outcomes or future outcomes on current outcomes. So it assumes that once you adjust for the previous outcomes, then you have taken care of the correlation structure. So obviously, these are very, very different uh, philosophically. Uh, but when you're dealing with continuous data, uh, surprisingly and uh, you know, usefully, uh, the interpretation of the parameters is actually essentially the same, regardless of what kind of approach you use. However, if you're dealing with more sophisticated or more complicated outcomes, like binary outcomes, then you really have to choose your modeling approach carefully. Again, this is something that we're not going to go into a lot of details today because it's beyond the scope, but it's something to pay attention to. So finally, we're going to close with very brief uh, introduction to what we call multi-level models, as in the children's health study where you have different levels of aggregation. You could have between times within subject comparison, between subjects within community comparison, and between community comparison. So these are three different potentially uh, important or uh, interesting uh, uh, comparisons that we really have to pay attention to and multi-level models actually allow you to do uh, things like that. And of course you can increase the number of uh, levels uh, depending on um, the uh, setting that you're dealing with. This is a very simple uh, cartoon to basically internalize or you know graphically depict what I just said so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. So when you translate that kind of cartoon, essentially you're translating this to uh, some sort of you know, modeling approach. Like in this case, level one, uh, you're dealing between times within subjects. Uh, and level two, you're dealing with between subjects within community. And level three, you're dealing with between communities. So essentially what you're doing is uh, fitting a level one model where you're trying to get um, 
each individual's slope or rate of change or level, and then he takes that to the level two and he tries to model that against something that's uh, you know specific to the community, and then adjust for other level two covariates like you know time independent covariates like uh, ethnicity, uh, gender or sex or you know other uh, things that do not change with time, and then finally. Uh, we have what we call an ecology comparison where you're trying to compare community level intercept, um, community level risk factors to the uh, community level adjusted slopes. Uh, in this case, if you're dealing with lung function, for instance, it could be uh, the rate of change of lung function at the community level. So essentially, you're trying to see whether living in a polluted community actually affects the level of lung function or the rate your lung is growing when you are a child, which was one of the main areas of interest for um, you know, the um, children's health study that we talked about briefly. Again, this is a, a variant of exactly the same thing that I told you about, but it focuses on some uh, you know, more details about uh, you know, what we can do with this kind of setting. Um, this following a few uh, cartoons essentially try to depict exactly what I said before. Uh, in level one, you're essentially fitting a line for each individual uh, participant, and then you're trying to get uh, a slope for each uh, line, and then you're basically fitting this model, of course, to be able to do that, and then you take those slopes from uh, what we call the level one model and try to see whether uh, they relate to something that's measured at the individual level. In this case, uh, you know, how far people live from heavy traffic, for instance, because where they live does not change uh, most of the times, and that's actually going to be not time dependent. Uh, and then finally, you try to get you know an average for each of the communities, and you do that for you know each of the communities, and you try to take that into the second, the third level. Basically, you're trying to see whether uh, you know the uh, community level slope is related to community level air pollution. In this case, this is actually one of the most important findings from the children's health study, where it was shown living in a polluted community uh, throughout childhood actually compromised lung function growth in a very um, important way, physiologically. So this is the third level, basically, that we talked about. And of course, as I said, nowadays we have the ability to fit the model together in a simultaneous way instead of doing it by stage, which is one of the advances of longitudinal gene analysis. So finally, I would like to close with um, trying to put it in the African context. So uh, a lot of the models were developed for data from developed countries, but when it comes to you know, low and middle income countries, things are actually even more complicated because of quality of data, which deals to, uh, leads to measurement error issues, where, for instance, you have lack of full outcome ascertainment, you know, if you're trying to measure mortality or morbidity, there may not be readily, a high quali readily available high quality data that you can just tap into. You actually have to collect it and then most of the time those come with issues in terms of quality. Uh, lack of continuous air quality data is a problem that uh, is about to, you know, starting to be resolved but still a long way to go. But the bottom line is actually to compromise the quality of the data and therefore in your modeling there are many, you know, issues or possibilities of bias and uh, you know things going wrong so you really have even to pay more attention uh, when you deal with this kind of data the confounding structure could be very different from what people have developed for uh, you know for uh, developed countries uh, you know high, high income countries like role of weather structure of long term time trend in when you're dealing with you know uh, studies like time series uh, of air you know air quality and uh, mortality uh, there could be multiple sources of the predictor, in this case, for instance, as an example of pollution. Uh, role of indoor sources, variations between countries when you're trying to deal a multi-country analysis. Uh, there could be a lot of you know, interesting and unique uh, migration issues um, that could actually completely disrupt you know, the way you design your studies. And of course, uh, the capacity to properly deal with complex data in the context of small effect size which usually is the case for environmental studies, is also something that people need to pay attention to. So the challenge is actually even more uh, signified or you know, kind of magnified when it comes to low and middle income countries, and therefore the statistics would be more challenging but also interesting in terms of uh, how to deal with uh, uh, you know, complex situations. So with this, uh, we finished the second part of this uh, lecture series. Uh, this actually completed what we covered uh, in the short course uh, in Nigeria.
and uh, we hope that you know the availability of these videos, the two videos, in addition to what my colleague uh, uh, Dr. Manolis Kojavinas uh, from IS Global also did on the epidemiology side, uh, together they will give you a good sense of what the short course was all about, and uh, you can actually use it uh, for your own research, but also in your own instructional um, uh, activities uh, in your own countries and uh, universities. With that, I thank you for. Um, uh, attending to this lecture uh, and have a nice day.